So today I've been on an assignment, recording a pad for a piano. But not just any piano, probably the most played piano on the planet today. Don't know about you, but I've always found organic acoustic sound sources easier to mix than electronic ones. I've accepted that it's something to do with the complexity of the, the waveforms or natural harmonics without actually really understanding it. But there's one thing I am certain about. Synths are an absolute bugger to mix. And that doesn't mean I don't like synths. Take the music of electronic pioneers craft work and compare it to the music of John Carpenter. You'll spot a similarity. Sparseness, but also the synths fucking loud. And why am I asking this question today? Well, it's directly linked to this old grubby bit of footage from about 12 years ago. This is the first outing of a felt piano, a piano with the Celeste pedal down that became Lab's soft piano, arguably one of the most downloaded virtual instruments of all time. So in a video linked above, we thought we'd go back and try and find this original piano. And what a journey that came to be because we found it in a town that's usually associated with smoked fish. Took it all the way down to the cinematic majesty of Air Studios and here's how it's turned out. <sighs> it's like an owl made of gold. You'll notice we've got this pad signal here, and this is why I'm asking the question today. I want this pad to be as beguiling as the piano. Now, under normal circumstances, I'd take the Juno 6 and shove it into a Strymon pedal, but these aren't normal circumstances. There is a long emotional connection to this project, so I wanted a pad that was as beguiling as the piano and the room it was recorded in. I also wanted something that was easy to mix against other instruments, but more importantly, within the context of film and TV. This is where it all began. The Tascam Porter One, four track cassette studio, which I got when I was 14. This was the moment where my mind opened to the possibilities of, yes, I can be, a music maker. I don't have to be in a rock band. I don't have to go to music college. I can simply make music all by my lonesome on a four track. This is the days before digital audio workstations. In the very, very early days of even samplers, the idea that you could have four tracks of multi-track in your home was just absurd. I still have a kind of muscle memory that the, the sense of these things being switched on and the sound of the VU uh, meters as they, as they flick up. This is a sine wave playing my favorite bass line. Sine waves are very pure in quality. They have this kind of parabolic, curvy nature. But for those of you watching on an iPhone or a smartphone, a tablet, or most laptops, you're probably unaware of anything going on at all. This is because the pitch is lower than the speakers of those devices are capable of reproducing. So for those of you watching on speakers, I'm gonna imitate the frequency response of a tablet or a phone or a laptop. It's as if nothing is going on at all, although you can see it is. So let me take it up one or two octaves. There it is, back again. Why don't we try the bass line with a bit of shash? Now that's an old post office term. Post office used to be the telephone telecommunications company in the UK. And it basically refers to a signal that contains lots of bandwidth. So kind of pink noise. Okay, now let's put in the B line. It's not clearly discernible.
here's that A in familiar form, uh, a waveform. So you've got time and you've got amplitude or volume. So there's a lot of it. What if we have a look at it instead of as a waveform, but as a, I think it's called a spectrograph. So this is time. But this isn't volume, this is actual frequency or pitch. And the amount of heat displayed illustrates how much volume by pitch. So you'll see the A here has a lot going on at its fundamental pitch, but very little going on above it compared to, say, the traffic, which is, sure, a lot of kind of low rumble, but has incredible amounts of heat throughout the bandwidth. And then if you have a look at the baseline, you'll see why it is easy to eclipse it with the traffic. There's just very little to it. It's incredibly low and there's nothing going on above. There's a track, When the Levee Breaks, by Led Zeppelin, which contains one of the most revered drum recordings of all time, certainly in the rock idiom. Now, I'm going to try and recreate that here. Here's the waveform, as you'd expect. Uh, clearly, uh, you've got these, these strong modulations here when we're hitting the drums. But what's extraordinary is when you turn up the spectrograph, there's really not much room at all. Here's an even purer digital sine wave playing the B line. So let's add in Chad. Not a chance. So what I take from that rather kind of extreme example is what we need to do to make our synths audible is either make the track sparser or the synths fucking loud. What about if I play that same A on a piano? Now, remember with the A, when we did this spectrograph, it really had a very profound fundamental. This is the pitch. Now with the piano, we put that in. It's not only giving us a lot more bandwidth than the sine wave, but actually you've got these clear stripes here. These are harmonics, resonances within the notes, fifths, octaves above. A piano is basically a dulcimer with a keyboard attached loaded into a cupboard. There are lots of strings in the dulcimer that resonate against each other and the cupboard itself has a resonant quality. Now to stop all of these things resonating all together at the same time there, there are dampers basically behind the keys. These lift as the key is hit. So what if I were to depress this note, but not so the hammer actually hits the string? So just very gently put that down. The damper is away from the E string. Now let's hit the A. Bingo, there's our E. But it's interesting because that E, I suspect, is not the actual pitch of the E being played. It's actually a harmonic above it. The E is resonating in sympathy with the A, and depending on their proximity to the original note, the other notes will resonate at different amounts. So the octaves, say another A, will resonate more readily with the other A because the waveform for this is twice as quick as the waveform for that, I think. So if I depress this one and strike the A, you'll hear that's a lot louder. And you'll see, curiously, the fundamental that resonates out is below the E, even though the A is above it. And this is why sampled pianos don't often sound like pianos. They can't really take into consideration all of these amazing interrelationships with notes being played. We very rarely play a piano monophonically like this. It has a kind of mechanical unpleasantness to it. We usually play at least a couple of notes at the same time. But a way that you can make sample pianos sound more realistic is to simply lift all the dampers off. And we do that with the sustain pedal. Original piano without the pedal and then with. And you'll see there's an incredible amount of bandwidth, but very much organized harmonically. Now I can change the shape of the wave to create some complexity in the upper harmonics. There's something that's still quite uniform about this shape, something still highly electronic. It doesn't have the chaos of, say, a roar. Rawr. 
So here's the sine wave uh, before we reshaped it. Lots of action going on in the bottom end. And the minute you alter the shape, all sorts of harmonic stuff starts going on. And there's all sorts of harmonic activity above the fundamental down here. The reshaped sine wave really just tramples over the entire bandwidth, whereas the A with the pedal is much more harmonically organized. So, I don't know, what if I were to convert this into lightning? This then creates harmonics above the original pitch, which is why you can now hear it on the phone, because there's stuff going on in the frequency range that your phone, iPad, laptop can reproduce. And if we compare the reshaped sign, uh, which really trampled over all of our bandwidth, with the lightning sign, well, we're much closer to true chaos. And compared to the A with the pedal down, much less harmonic organisation. It's the first time I've, I've unwrapped one of these for a while, a cassette. And again, all of the old habits come back, the muscle memory, the, the sense of expectation of your blank slate. And um, oh, it's just so wonderful to be back. I mean, back in the day, these things must have been an absolute marvel. Basically a reel-to-reel -reel tape machine housed in its own uh, protective casing with just the tape exposed here. Right, now the first thing you'll notice is at first the tape itself is, is clear. This is what's called leader. So you don't want to record straight away. And in fact, you want to give a few seconds as the leader spools into the tape itself. So you can actually see, or when the leader finishes, I can see it spooling around there. Here we go. And that's the tape. And I'm just going to give it a few seconds and hit zero there. Now with zero return uh, engaged, basically, you rewind and it takes you back to the beginning. Four tracks, how does it work? Well, cassettes are stereo, but they have an A and a B side. So those are four channels. So A, left and right, B, left and right, which basically means you can record up to four tracks in mono. Sight helps us find stuff and smell tells us whether it's good to eat, which is why we like familial smells, even if, for me, they mean burnt garlic and salad cream. But I would say our most acute sense is that of hearing, because it not only listens, it judges where the sound is coming from, up, down, left or right, in front of us, behind us, to the side, and how far away it is. And things that eat us tend to be heavy, growly, thumpy and roary. Which is why the further up in pitch tends to be associated with more feminine side of our frequency spectrum. If your mum's singing you to sleep, chances are you're safe. Ah, oh, mummy. If something sounds low and rumbly, chances are you're not. Ah, oh, mummy. Unless it's a bass line. ba doo da da Ah, oh, daddy. What relation is this sound to me? Is it my daddy singing or is it the deep menacing drone of Mordor? Even though my voice is louder now than it was in the last clip, you know that I'm speaking quietly. Now whilst this is quieter, you know that I'm shouting because my voice is distorting. <laughs> In the 1980s, they developed a way of really making quite a pure wave like this much more complex, and that was to modulate it with another wave. This was called FM synthesis, or frequency modulation, and you could stack up a huge number of these modulators to change the perceived pitch, the complexity, create metallic tones. But this still isn't complex enough for our ears. This is a synth nerd playing a DX7 in the distance, not a bear or a roary tiger. Which is what makes our hearing so miraculous that we can discern between true chaos and electronically manufactured chaos 
Computers can't create true randomness. It's just a very long list of seemingly random numbers. And there's something about our brains that just understands that that is not true chaotic behavior. There's too many ones, there's too many sevens, which is why we can't really hear the difference between a distortion manufactured inside a computer compared to that that is emanating from a dirty old filthy tweed amp. We just find it less agreeable, which is why I think that electronic music back in the day was more agreeable. Real circuits into real tape machines that were creating natural harmonic distortion. Now in a video I made a couple of months back, I spoke to an engineer about Pro Tools and the fact that they'd introduced about 10 years ago, I think, this heat function that actually added harmonic and inharmonic distortion to your mixes. Imagine a digital audio workstation actively distorting the signal you are putting into it. The reason they did that is because our ears are honed to nuance. It's not a matter of how it sounds, it's simply how it makes us feel. When I hum, it doesn't produce a pure sine wave. In fact, there are all sorts of natural harmonics above the natural pitch that I was singing at. But if I growl the same note, or a note close to it, it becomes chaotic, distorted, inharmonic. We respond to great singers, not because of their ability to sing fast, or high, low, or loud, or indeed create a pure waveform like that of a choir boy. When Whitney Houston moves us, it's not with her vocal gymnastics, it's when her voice cracks, distorts, goes out of tune. That's when we feel, on an emotional level, her angst, her pain. Awesome. And what we'll probably do later is uh, just have a little play with the pitch control live. It's great, kind of really musical. But also there's other things that you can really do to mess around with how the, uh, the playback occurs. I love it, it just introduces all of these different artifacts that aren't digitally created. So let's uh, plug the output of this into this and switch this bad boy on. Whoa, look at that. So I'm currently monitoring through the Eurorack as opposed to just directly into Logic and there's a reason for that because I want to have more fun, more tape fun. So we've got one, two, I think we should add a third into the equation. The Replicator T-Rex handcrafted in Denmark. It's a cassette delay unit, well cassette of sorts. It seems to be its own unique form of cassette which has these extraordinary kind of uh, tape crossing patterns here, but it's on an endless loop. So that itself is a cassette loop. Now there's this TED talk by David Byrne where he asserts that the evolution of music is as much to do the rooms in which it was performed. When music of the classical era was performed in rich people's houses, in chambers, that it became detailed and, and, and very intricate, whereas cathedral, masses, choirs had to employ longer, slower music that suited the space. With these things, with synths, it is basically what happens to speakers when you put some voltage through them at different frequencies. It's never existed in any space. I mean, you could say it's existed within some circuitry. We're cheating. We're not making sound. We're operating our speakers with voltage machines. So let's get back to me shouting in this tunnel. Not only is my voice distorting, it's also reverberating. It's exciting this space to tell you where I am. In the late 1970s and certainly in the 1980s, 
instead of making our synths mix in with our music, we made our music mix in with our synths. We started recording things dry, without resonance, without reverberation, harmonic or natural distortion, or distortion of any type. And when we went into the box, we sterilised our music even further. We've got our 1970s sound. Right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch it to a tighter, closer mic'd mix, and I'm going to pitch it back up. So here's the original fat 70s recording. Here's the tighter, more modern chili pepper sound. You'll see that immediately there's a lot more space between the waveforms. Let's go back to the big version and have a look at the spectrograph. You'll see, if you remember, lots of bandwidth, just everything kind of clattering around all the time compared with the tighter version where the notes are clearly defined. And even with quite a kind of busy beat like this, you have spaces where there's very little sound at all. So not only do we want everything to have punch, but we also want to scoop frequencies out so everything sits in its own frequency range. Admittedly not the greatest drum sound. 1970s, 1990s, then when we put our pretty awful EQ on, gaps appear. So I took the soft piano notes and time stretched them so they sustained. Then, one, two, three tape units. I molted out the signal so the Danish cassette player wasn't growling all of the time, stuck this signal into a low pass filter, and then opened and closed it with this thing called OKID by DivKid, arguably the most musical piece of Eurorack kit I own. I mixed the two signals together in this LPF, but fully open, to give it a bit of Estonian love. And because we've got the signal going through three tape decks, I didn't want huge amounts of hiss buildup. So I decapitated the signal with this filter unit, finally terminating in this all new monsoon reverb thingy, a new take on the discontinued mutable instruments clouds and distributed by the geniuses in Bristol that are Slate and Ash. Right. Really happy with that. I think it's really kind of interesting. Certainly there's a lot of investment in that sound. However, it is slightly just kind of reverby, washy for me. So I wonder if we can't think about creating a second signal, which is just a little more defined, has a little bit more proximity. This is gonna be a pad that sits behind the piano after all, but I just wonder if there's any way of just getting a little bit more upfrontness to it. So what I'm gonna do is disengage the monsoon and patch up the magneto, which is more of a, a kind of tape delay, uh, less of this digital fluttery reverb. So here's just the, uh, the dry image. I'm just going to introduce, it's got this great spring. Right, so logic into record, Tascam into play. things, vintage synths, are so valuable now, so uh, desired. It's as if the chaos, the unpredictability is something we actually yearn. The fact that there are electronic circuitry inside that is creating harmonic distortions. I love kind of thinking of warmth, say for example, with the beautiful old Moog, is, is not in fact a richness in bottom end, but is the presence of the feminine, the upper harmonics, that is what we desire, which is why we also want reverbs like plates and springs, and if it's gonna be digital, it be, should be old, to create resonance, to create distortion, to create context. So, in summary, why are synths difficult to mix? 
they're simply not complex enough for our hyper-nuanced sonic needs as mammals. We don't know what they are, and we don't know where they are. Which is why we shouldn't be at all surprised about the comeback of vinyl, or indeed the cult following of cassette. I mean, even fucking Taylor Swift has gone all folk on us. Because we require it as mammals from here. And you may ask, well, if that's the case, why do we put up with digital? Surely that would not satisfy us. Well, it is a proxy, but it is a proxy of true chaos made by a chaotic species. So today I've been on an assignment, recording a pad for a piano. But not just any piano, probably the most played piano on the planet today. Pitch pens. You hit the little bleeds of the Raptor cassette there. What I quite like here is I haven't actually looped those pads and there's something nice because they don't just kind of run away with themselves, they gradually die out. I hope this pad matches the quality and the idiosyncrasy of the recordings we made at Air Studios, the beauty and surprising nature of this old Yamaha U3 and provide something that is not only easier to mix into our music, but is something that, as mammals, we respond to in here. Thanks, as always, for watching. It's wonderful to be back. Do subscribe if you haven't done already. There's gonna be lots more videos like this coming up. Ding the bell to be notified the next time I put up a video, and one of those, always much appreciated. See you next time.